Southerton. I work as the um, assistant director for the Center for the Study of Canada at the State University of New York College at Plattsburgh. And um, the title of my presentation is Teaching Canada's Constitutional Democracy. I'm not Canadian. I am American. I grew up in central New York and I wanted to learn about the rest of the world. That's what I knew I wanted to do when I was in high school. And I just sort of looked north to the closest neighbor and I got hooked. And um, I work in education outreach. I don't have a PhD. I am not an expert in any way um, on um, anything really, but <laughs> I do know a lot about a lot of different things. And I guess that puts me in my job as an outreach education coordinator. So um, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll screen share just to give you a bit of an overview on uh, what I was hoping to do today. And um, we'll just learn to get the next slide up here. All right. So um, if you're open to it, I'd love to hear from the audience members just to ask like what drew you to this session? Um, what particular topics you're interested in? Why, why are you interested in, uh, in Canada? Um, in terms of a background, the points I wanted to go over are, is it important for Americans to learn about Canada? Is Canada different from the US? Talk a little bit about population density, regionalism, last year's election, as well as foundation principles move into an activity on teaching guides and then wrap it up with a discussion. So that's the overall plan for the session. Um, I do wanna say that my work is supported as uh, a part of a network of national resource centers on Canada. Uh, we are funded by the US Department of Education. It's a Title VI program. So there's a lot of different Title VI programs that do area studies around the world. Um, so that would be different area, like areas like Middle Eastern studies, Canadian studies, European studies. Uh, there's about a hundred of these centers that do different world regions focus for area studies. And there's two out of a hundred that focus on Canada. So my partners are at the University of Maine, as well as the University of Washington and Western Washington University. And we put together teacher institutes when the border is open and we do newsletters uh, and then professional development in different forms be it through webinars or um, you know working with different educational collaboratives um, so one um, thing i do want to mention for those people who might be a member of the national council for the social studies is that we do have a special interest group called the canada community so if you're interested in canada please join us we don't have 50 members yet, so every person counts. And um, we are pretty active at the, at the annual conference for NCSS each year. And we also recently hosted a virtual learning webinar on the indigenous land you live on going beyond territory acknowledgements. So um, I'll go ahead and I'll just put in the chat some resources like to, um, you know, how you, where you could go to sign up for one of my colleagues uh, newsletter, which is the K-12 Study Canada that comes out every three months. And then um, I also will put in the chat a link to the resources from our recently offered webinar. And um, in the meantime, I guess I'd just like to turn it over to the audience to say, Hey, what brought you to this session? Anybody want to start? Um, a couple of semesters ago, I took a class about on European governments. So we went over Great Britain, France, Spain, Italy, and Germany. So this seemed like a synopsis of another country. And I really enjoyed that class. So that's why. I have a number of Canadian colleagues. I work um, in religious literacy education, and I know quite a bit about the religious literacy landscape in Canada, but not so much the, the government part of it. So I'm interested to hear about that aspect of it. Um, hi, and I put into the chat, um, I 
I'm interested in learning. I think what I know about Canadian government was probably all came from a satirical novel in which um, the Canadian Space Agency picked a civilian to send into space um, in order to bring publicity to their uh, department and it spoofed various levels, various aspects of Canadian civil service, but I don't think I learned a lot um, in specifics and I know embarrassingly little for someone who's lived within 400 miles of Canada most of my life. Well, thank you for sharing those comments with me. I really, really appreciate the interest. Um, apparently not that needed to put things into the chat while I'm, I'm listening and thinking. So I'm, I'm trying to get there on those two links. And while, while I'm at it, I'll just add another one um, there as well. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, and these might not look the nicest when I put them in the chat because I put them all in there together. So I'm still working on perfecting my technology skills here, like everybody these days, right? So um, thank you for that. I uh, really am excited to meet you all. We did have, I think, eight in total sign up. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the, the time out of your, your day to join me. And um, with that, I guess I just want to try to answer that question of, is it important for Americans to learn about Canada? Um, so here we go with the PowerPoint. All right, so um, the key point here is that Canada and the US maintain the world's second largest trading relationship. The US-China trade relationship recently surpassed the Canada-US trade relationship. And now that's the largest trading relationship in the world. But still that US-Canada relationship is really so important from an economic perspective, it impacts our lives very much so. So 35 states have Canada as the number one trade partner for exports. And the US uh, exports of goods and services to Canada support an estimated 1.6 million jobs. And that was in 2015, so those stats are going up but people will estimate that up to 8 million jobs in the US are connected to our trade with Canada. And Canada is also our largest export market for agricultural products. I show this slide just because it's kind of funny. It makes us think. Um, the slide says Canada leading the world and being just north of the United States. I mean, it's, it's a joke, but it makes us think well, why is Canada important? And I think for Americans, most of us just think it's important because of its relationship with the United States. And we think of Canada as, you know, having an identity that's only built in comparison to the United States. So it's just, it's just something funny to sort of get us thinking about, well, what does Canada mean to us and why is it important? And, you know, is it important for Americans to learn about it? Um, well, from an economic perspective, I would say so, yes. Uh, we talked about that. But um, this is a, another sort of, you know, make you think and laugh uh, infographic. And uh, there's always room for improvement regarding our knowledge about Canada. But this was actually a Canadian made infographic about, well, you know, this is what people probably think about Canada. But I'd like to challenge us to say, well, let's move beyond the stereotypes. And I think we can do that with your help. So um, here's a slide identifying the provinces and territories in comparison to that infographic. Of course, I hope you can all name those 10 provinces and three territories. Um, and if not, you know, there's always room for the future. 
But certainly American knowledge of Canadian geography is, is oftentimes a joke in Canada. Um, so Canada has about one tenth of the population of the US and a very common map that uh, educators in Canadian studies will show is the population density map. And uh, basic facts about population density are that 75% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the US border, 80% of Canadians live in urban areas, and population density in the country is one of the lowest in the world with 3.3 people per square kilometer. You can, that point of the urbanization of Canada is really interesting. Um, and that is a key difference between the US and Canada. Um, the concept of regionalism is also very important to Canada. So it's a, it's a reality in Canadian society and politics. Canada is a collection of regions that have managed to stay together. So what are the regions in Canada? Well, it kind of depends on who you ask. Um, let's say that the region of Northern Canada stays the same for most people. Uh, that would be the three territories of the Yukon, Northwest Territories and Nunavut. And the region of the Atlantic Canada would always comprise Newfoundland and Labrador, which is one province, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick. Whereas the concept of central Canada, you know, if you don't live in central Canada, you might view central Canada as a region, but certainly if you lived in central Canada, you would not really think that you're the same region because Ontario views are very different from Quebec views. And in terms of the concept of the West, British Columbia, obviously the West, but it may or may not include Alberta. The idea of the prairies as a region may or may not include Alberta. So it just sort of depends on what situation you're talking about in terms of regionalism in Canada. And it has a huge impact on politics. For example, the different political parties do well in different geographic regions. Traditionally, liberals do well in Ontario, conservatives do well in the West, the Bloc Québécois does well in Quebec. So in 2019, exactly one year ago today was the federal election. And um, the election prior to that was in 2015. So in 2015, after a decade, Stephen Harper um, you know, conservative government lost and Justin Trudeau's liberal government won a majority. 20, that was in 2015. 2019, it was a scheduled election. Justin Trudeau's um, majority government lost its majority and became a minority government. And um, the conservative party uh, ended up with um, you know, 121 seats, but the leader had to step down after the election. And that also happened in terms of the Green Party. So there's five uh, federal political parties in Canada and um, the red are the liberals, the dark blue are the conservatives, the light blue are the Bloc Québécois, the um, Yellow, orange is the New Democratic Party and the green is the Green Party. So after the 2019 election, two leaders of uh, federal political parties stepped down just because they didn't fare that well in the election. And um, only recently from the summer and just a few days ago did they elect uh, new leaders. So it's, it's you know constantly changing. But um, what I want to point out is that the concept of regionalism in Canada really has an impact on politics. And so we're going to have a look at this map. And um, you can see that concept of re regionalism playing out in the politics. So, you know, I just wanted to, to move on there, do a time check. All right. So, um, why is it that Canada is so different 
than the United States. We talk about regionalism, we talk about population density, but ultimately what scholars will always say is that it's because of how our countries were founded and that's what results in us being so different. And so the idea of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness in comparison to the concept in Canada of peace, order and good government are really what drives us in different political and policy uh, outcomes when it comes to what's happening at our national governments. So um, everybody seems to agree, you know, these founding concepts are something important to note. So the British North America Act of 1867, which is also called the Constitution Act of 1867 in Canada, merged Upper Canada, known as Ontario, and Lower Canada, known as Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia into the dominion of Canada. So that phrase of peace, order and good government were the words used in section 91 of that British North America Act 1867 to define the Canadian Parliament's lawmaking authority over provincial authorities. It's, it's a vague phrase, but it's caused tensions between federal and provincial governments. But what it really does is spell out the powers of the provincial domain versus the federal domain. And so the phrase peace, order and good government gradually evolved into this concept of Canadian national identity beyond its original constitutional purpose. The POG, as it's uh, known in Canada, sort of became a counterpart to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. People suggest that peace order good government concept defines Canada more as having an interest in the collective well being of its people, whereas the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as stated in the US Declaration of Independence, are more uh, promoting individualism. And so this plays out this um, difference between um, communitarianism versus individualism on a regular basis uh, when we compare Canada and the US. So um, in terms of how it's set up, just some, some basic differences. Uh, Canada is a parliamentary democracy. It's also a constitutional monarchy. So the, um, the queen is the head of the state and in Canada, the governor general represents the queen as the head of the state. Prime Minister is the head of government and the Prime Minister is the leader of the largest party in Parliament. So Canada operates as a fusion of powers more so um, than when you compare it to the US that operates as a separation of powers. I, um, so I think I'll just go to this slide where you can see this sort of outline of the separation of powers versus the fusion of powers. And, you know, I could go more into a lot of differences here, but I, um, you know, just want to highlight some ideas um, when we talk about big comparisons. So Canada has two official languages, whereas the US only has one official language. And um, that relates to its founding when the English took over the French, the English had to accommodate the French differences. And so they did that and eventually Canada became an officially bilingual country. So I'm going to go ahead and um, try to switch the browser in hopes that I will show you a slide um, that I have access to. I think I have to stop share to do that. So um, what I'd like to just check in with you folks is to say, were you able to open the link that I sent you with the teaching guides? I yes, I have ahead. it open now. Yes. When did you send it out? Okay, um, what I'll do is I'll put the link in the chat and then okay. um, you'll have access to it.
All right, thank you. Bear with me while I um, get this right here. Um, I sent the email this morning. I hope that will open it. Oh, and to answer Allison's question, so it's um, peace, order, and good government. So it's order. Thank you for the question. So um, we are how many people in the session? I'm going to guess that um, Gorman will not want to do the activity. But what I was thinking we would do is just um, see what might be useful for you. So if you consult the document that I gave you the link for, you should see a list of approximately 30 different teaching guides. And my thought is that every um, participant has different needs and goals with these sessions. And so I just wanted to offer you a number of resources and to carve out some time in this session for you to check them out because I don't know if you're teaching about Canadian topics in your classroom. And um, hello to the participant who was not here earlier when we did introductions. So nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so what are your thoughts on doing this activity? The goal is to say, take 10 minutes, look at a guide or two, come back, tell me what you think. You could do it either individually or um, together. I gave you 30 options. So there's a lot of topics there. So if you know which topic you might want to check out, go ahead and um, maybe share with us which one you want to check out and see if another participant wants to join you or find another topic to check out. Allison is not going to do the activities. Thank you, Allison. For those of you who don't have much experience with Canada, um, it might be interesting to check out some of the things under the Historica Canada list. Um, I was really impressed with their Indigenous Perspectives Education Guide. Indigenous issues in Canada uh, are the minority topic of discussion daily. Another difference in the US, I suppose. Um, there was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place um, as a follow-up to approximately 150 years of history of residential schools and um, following that Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there were 94 calls for action, which uh, have resulted in some amazing educational resources that focus on Indigenous perspectives. And the one created by Historica Canada is quite interesting. So I just mentioned that. Um, I'm looking at the one... Um discover how Canadians govern themselves and it's a timeline. Um, and you click on each year. That is a classic. That was um, developed by Eugene Forsey. Well, um, the How Canadian Govern Themselves is a classic book like developed by a former senator. And those additional uh, supporting electronic tools are interesting. So thank you for checking those out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the interactive um, tools that give you information. So this is definitely, I would definitely save.
the civics uh, number seven and eight they have a number of lessons there for both the elementary and secondary classrooms Are any of you familiar with Canada's History Magazine? No. That's an excellent resource. And they might have, I don't know, 40 to 60 different lesson plans there. I picked a few that just relate to government politics. What I, what I find is that despite that some states have curriculum requirements with Canadian content, a lot of teachers may or may not be teaching Canadian content. And so my goal was to just sort of put together a list of resources that are Canadian made for educators and then to highlight the ones that might be relevant for US classrooms. Mr. Ferreria, is there any particular topic you have an interest in? Well, actually, I just posted a question. Um, oh. And do you know if there is an emphasis on the teaching of civics education in Canada uh, that's more formal, nationwide, what have you, compared to the more piecemeal approach that seems to be happening here in the United States, where some states are pushing for it, others not doing it, and you know, there's been this big hoopla lately over teaching civics. Um, has there been an emphasis on this in Canada? Based on the limited amount of resources that I found, I really don't think there is. I'm not an expert in this area. I'm not the best one to answer your question. Um, but that organization, Civics, um, I think it's number seven and eight. They're going to be, you know, one organization could that could better answer that question. For example, mm -hmm. um, the other organizations that have these teacher guides put out there um, have a lot of other teacher guides. Mm -hmm. So the Parliament, Parliament of Canada, of course, is developing its own tools. Um, they, many of these have been around for a lot of years. Um, they have made some new resources recently. Mm -hmm. um, the other, uh, the, you know, the law lessons produced by the Justice Education Society and the Ontario Justice Education Network these are law-based organizations who are trying to do educational outreach. Historica Canada is probably the gold standard in terms of an organization that creates educational materials for teachers that are accessible online. Uh, Canada's History Magazine, while they do have an education section, that's not their only uh, audience. You know, teachers are not their only audience. And Elections Canada, again, they're, they're trying to develop tools to um, help teachers as a, a form of outreach. But that, that's why I just highlight the one organization that's truly dedicated to civics education in Canada. I'm actually looking at the Historic Canada, Historic Canada uh, Citizenship Challenge. And some of these features, you know, they seem to be very interesting and very useful. And given the fact that, you know, in, 
In the current political climate in this country, <clears throat> uh, there's a greater emphasis on civic, civics education and a push, at least in some quarters, to increase it. I was just kind of curious as to whether or not it had been a focus in Canada, if there are the concerns in Canada that there isn't enough civics education like we seem to have, be realizing here. Um, I mean, I may be asking a question that's that you may not know the answer to, but is there is there electoral participation le level much the same as ours? I mean, do they get a higher turnout for elections? Do they get a lower turnout for elections? You know, I know that you know with the with the past election, um, I follow the news on the CBC, so I get a sense of you know what political sniping takes place back and forth between the different parties but I don't really get a sense of how many people are actually participating in the electoral process. I'm just seeing if I have any good resources. Um, yeah. To help answer those, some of those great questions. I wonder if it varies a lot by province as well, since there's no federal ministry of education or department of education, yeah. each province is like even more independent than each of the US states are. Um, as I discovered when doing research for another project. Oh, okay. The, the, the data they keep on various measures by province is very limited compared to how much data we collect in the US about like numbers of students and race and age and gender and mm. you know all the different demographics on teachers as well. So there's um, kind of a different approach in terms of like the departmental level. It's even more decentralized. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know how that relates to like curriculum standards as much, but um, there's definitely no national. It's looking like um, a, about 50%, uh, just under 50% participate in uh, elections in, for voter turnout in Canada. So that's, that's comparable with what we go through. Okay. I'm looking at the indigenous perspectives guide, which is really great and then the accompanying articles from the um, Canadian Encyclopedia which are also is a great website um, and I'm curious if there have been efforts for lesson plans or materials that are aimed at U.S. students or teachers to take the lessons from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission mm. and use that as a model for thinking about the similar issues that are in the U.S. that haven't been addressed in the same ways. So there were um, two resources just released by Canada's History Magazine that would address exactly what you're talking about. It's number 30 and number 32 on the, the list. Um, I feel like they um, are similar, but maybe aged, um, you know, targeted for different age groups. The um, other um, list I would suggest you check out uh, on that topic is the one we put together for that you know indigenous land webinar we did. There's some other good resources there. There's a, the National Truth and Reconciliation Center is based out of the University of Na Manitoba and uh, Monique Gray Smith put together a pretty good reconciliation guide uh, for them that I would recommend. Thank you. Mm. And in terms of, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my brain to tell you something, <laughs> Mr. Ferreria, and I have it, and then I lose it, and then I have it, and then I lose it. So I have to try to remember where my brain was going. Um, it's okay. It's fun. <laughs> I mean, as I noted, I studied in Canada. I did a graduate degree there, so I'm, I'm I at least have a familiarity, at least dating back to the late 80s. 
So here, here's my comment about your question on civics education in Canada. I think it's been focused for the last few decades on trying to train up new Canadians. Oh, I and see. So you see that with the citizenship challenge. Right. And I think that's really where the focus has been. Okay. is trying to engage new Canadians in that process, much more so than engaging Canadians who've been there for a few generations or more. Okay, that's interesting. Canada just hit 38 million uh, as its population mark at the end of uh, September. So uh, that's it's, uh, been a long time coming for that. But yeah. um, I think I think the, you know, the number of immigrants that they hope to recruit over the next uh, decade, mm -hmm. you know, is, is a lot per year. And yeah. so that's, that's why I think, you know, you see that focus on citizenship education being targeted for immigrants in particular. Hmm. Okay. All right. So they don't, I mean, again, I realize that this is not your area of expertise, so they don't have a, a concern that you know, those that are already born in Canada are not necessarily being encouraged in a more formal way in the classroom to be civically engaged. While I see a lot of focus in our inquiry design models, trying to involve action into the social studies classroom, that I mean, I'm seeing it somewhat in these examples of teaching guides, but this is new. Yeah. Inquiry's been there, but taking that next step for informed action, I'm not seeing that in Canadian examples. Okay. All right. I find it interesting because, you know, I've, I pay attention to what's going on with Canadian government and Canadian politics and it just seems as though good, bad, or indifferent, their, their degree of polarization is starting to creep up, which is not something that I remember being as much of an issue back when I was there in the late eighties, uh, you know, and, and, you know, lived there for the better part of a year and a half. Um, there didn't seem to be that kind of, I mean, obviously there's political difference, but there wasn't that kind of hard edge to it. You know, it seemed like there was more opp more opportunity, more desire to work across the aisle and cooperatively and starting to see what's happening here become more common there. And it's just, I'm kind of curious as to how that may be influencing whether or not people think it's time to have students get more involved, to get them no more knowledgeable maybe to counteract that before they follow us down a certain dark path. <laughs> so with the uh, government being based more on that fusion of power, the simple act of voting is going mm -hmm. to result in that government who wins the election able to push their agenda forward more so than in the U.S. because of mm -hmm. how the systems are designed right and so I think you know when it comes to youth that get the vote out is very common um, the other thing I would just say is that the ideas of nationalism and or regionalism in Canada always comes through on the politics yeah. And so from, you know, the 60s to the mid 90s, there was a lot of push for Quebec separatism. And with the recent election in 2019, of course, what's happened is there's talk of Wexit, so mm -hmm. Western exit. And so, you know, the, the idea of Canada is a bit of um, a question mark, mm -hmm. right? And we see that because of the regional nature of people and their identities playing out through politics. But it's, it's an experiment 
And um, it is exciting to watch and it's exciting, I think, for Americans to compare ourselves to. I have a question regarding um, the provinces. So can a province decide to leave? Because then obviously in all, we don't have a confederation, so we can't do that. But in a confederation, you can. It's not binding um, for the long term. So how does that apply to Canada? There's um, one resource on the list I would draw your attention to, to answer that. And it's number 18. So the question of Quebec sovereignty was brought to uh, the highest court. And that lesson plan goes through the outcome. Okay. Yeah, I remember that succession of votes because it wasn't just once, it was on, it was what, three times? Between the late 80s and the early 90s that they voted to separate? I mean, it, it didn't make it. But. 95. Mm -hmm. So two referenda in okay. Quebec. And the last one in 95 resulted in less than a 1% uh, difference for the yeas or the nays. There's not too much support for Quebec separation at this point. I mean, it's still an issue. It will probably always be an issue, but it doesn't have much political support right now. And what about um, the British Columbia? You were referring to um, the Western side of Canada. It's mostly in Alberta, actually, yeah, okay. where you're getting that movement for Wexit. And when you look at that um, map, and maybe I'll try to present it again from, a, um, from the 2019 election, you see that there were no seats um, so, voted in from the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. So in that election, Alberta results with no seats going to the governing federal party. So conservatives got all the seats, 33, and they're, you know, not in power. And so it's this liberal agenda I mean, you also see that in Saskatchewan as well. And all they um, done by, I know it's like seats like districts within the provinces or that's like percentage of the vote? Um, they would be ridings. Yep. And so, you know, no riding has an elected liberal representative in the federal government. They have 33 conservative members of parliament and one from the New Democratic Party. So for writing Alberta. all, um, that be all equivalent to like a congressional district? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. And in Canada, the senators are appointed. So it's only members of parliament, uh, members of parliament that are elected by the people. And that kind of goes with the Westminster model with the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Right. And does that reflect that the House of Lords in Canada's case, the Senate doesn't have nearly as much power or, okay. <clears throat> now there has been discussion about making the Senate an elected Senate, right? Yes, Senate reform is often talked about, but uh, apparently not pushed <laughs> enough. Yeah, well, I can imagine that the House of Commons probably doesn't necessarily want to have to share power. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. Reorganizing government is a big challenge. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. Would you be able to um, send us the PowerPoint that you were using? For sure, I'll go ahead and I'll put the, the link right in that uh, shared document. Oh, great, great idea, okay. thank you. Thank you. Let's What parts of Canadian history, political science, etc., are most typically included in American um, social studies classes? Do you feel? Well, I teach. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say I teach world history, and I include it as part of my unit on imperialism because I make sure that the students know the difference between, you know, the governed colonies and the self-governing colonies of the British empire, because obviously there were not any self-governing colonies and the others. Um, but that's really all I end up having time for, given how crammed our world history curriculum is. I'm in Massachusetts. So the world history curriculum is just very content heavy. <laughs> I'd say you're an overachiever by bringing in any Canadian content in a world history class uh, where uh, I typically see Canadian content is in the elementary classroom, Massachusetts, that's grade four, uh, New York State, grade five, Georgia has a chunk um, in grade six, Oklahoma, grade six, uh, those would be states with units. I think Washington might also have like a suggested time for unit at the elementary classroom, but uh, otherwise uh, you're going to only find required Canadian content in certain topics and it, it will be, it, it's more incumbent upon the teacher with specific, you know, who might have personal interests in Canada to then want to teach about it because we are not well educated about Canada or lots of other places around the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, oh, I'm uh, right there with you. <laughs> yeah. What are the projects that um, I'm trying to work on with our colleagues at the University of Maine and Western Washington University is to come up with some good compelling questions that we can write inquiry design models on so if you have any compelling questions that um, you know you think you'd like to answer or if you're teaching something um, or want to teach something and want to work with myself and Betsy Arnson at the University of Maine, we are trying to do one every three months. 
So the first one we started was the summer and we looked at our national holidays for everyone. Mm. And that was our compelling question. And we tried to present sources and tasks from Canadian perspective. Um, the one we're working on right now relates to uh, what can settlers learn from Indigenous peoples. We're not really uh, totally keen on our compelling question, but we're, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to sort of put out a IBM-like newsletter. It's sort of like a take on the IBM. It's not the precise mm -hmm. IBM model, uh, but you know, in the future, we'll um, we'll probably do one on why didn't Canada, you know, join the American Revolution? That was like a topic we thought would be good to answer for Americans. But if you have questions, you know, that you say, what? this is a good question, but I, I need some resources to help answer it for my classroom. I'd love to hear from you. Another one we're working on is, um, did Algonquin peoples, um, you know, it, it, it relates to, did Algonquin peoples have to form an alliance with the French? Like, did they have to work with the French, you, you know? I Actually, I might want to, I'm, I'm going to try to share this with my own department, uh, these resources, because uh, our ninth grade is where the students get uh, the seven years war slash French and Indian war. And so, you know, I know that my colleagues are not well up on the Canadian end of that <laughs> um, as much as they probably should be. It tends to get a hop, skip and a jump through there. And what I try to do, what I've got juniors teaching you know, for world history. And, you know, I point out to them that it's probably not a bad idea if they learn at least something about Canada, but given the fact how, that Canada is an important trading partner and it's our nearest neighbor and, you know, the, the longest, quote unquote, undefended border in the world and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I try to get them to appreciate that there's a reason why you should know what our neighbors are up to. <laughs> especially in New England. <laughs> Economically, I know that they have, um, isn't their government more involved in um, the, the free market, so to speak, because they have a bigger safe social programs and safety net and they have um, centralized healthcare. Um, is, do they also differ from the sociological aspect of racial tensions and um, income dis dis disparity and things of that nature that we've seen a lot of um, issues or conf in internal conflict in the recent years or do does just the demographics not shift towards that? Uh, when it comes to racial tensions, the um, historic relation between the French and the English would be a topic to highlight. Yeah. Which would, you know, end in that need or desire for Quebec separatism in politics. And more recently, the last, say, um, decade and a half, the major issue when it comes to ethnic divides is really about improving the relationship with indigenous people. So oh. Canada has a history of those Indian residential schools up until 1996 is when the last school closed. And yep. so that is the, what is in the news. Uh, you're not, while there is certainly a lot of support towards Black Lives Matter movement in Canada, the history of slavery is different yeah. and ended you know much earlier than in the united states and yeah. it's making amends first and foremost with indigenous people that's 
what's happening in Canada is trying to right those wrongs. And the statistics um, there are very drastic. Uh, you could find a, a lot of information about the uh, inequality of treatment towards Indigenous peoples in Canada, and probably also in the United States as well. But in Canada, that topic has just uh, really gotten a lot of attention. And it speaks to our differences in government. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually came out of a class action lawsuit. So uh, that helped move things along. And I think just the idea of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is a topic that's talked about regularly. I mean, aside from the news, when you look at educational institutions, they'll acknowledge whose Indigenous land they're living on. And so it becomes a reminder on a daily basis that, you know, we're on settlers, non-Indigenous people are on land that was once land for other people. And, you know, what is the history of that land um, today? So there's, there's a lot of resources that are focused on that. I would recommend the nativeland.ca website as a great starting point for that topic. Um, it is a map of um, North and South America and you can research uh, your, where you are today and, and have a look what at- What is that? Nativeland.ca. Okay. Is that not on the list? Um, I put it in the chat. Okay. You know, I'll add it to my own list then. <laughs> that way I can remember it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry when I put those other resources in the chat, I didn't do a great job to divide them up. So I would just refer you to, um, this uh, link as well, which were some resources on that topic. Um, I do see that it's 515. Uh, so I do want to say that officially we'll conclude here. Mm -hmm. um, but I really appreciate your time and the opportunity to engage with you. I'm I, available in the future if you ever want to connect. Um, but uh, thank you so much for your interest. And I would love to hear from you in the future. That's great. Thank, thank you. you. These are great resources. Yeah, they really are. Be very helpful. Thank you very much. Great to meet you. Nice Have meeting. a Boston. How's it going there?